Welcome to Revive. This is a place for young adults like you to worship God with people in the same life stage. We're here every single week to become more like Jesus, the true you that God has designed you to be, and how to more lovingly share in the soul-satisfying love of Jesus. Some people come to Revive to meet other young adults. If that's you, Make sure you connect with someone on the hospitality team before or after Revive, and also fill out the Revive Connections form. Some people come to Revive looking to share their gifts, like music, prayer, audiovisual, or hospitality. If that's you, fill out the volunteer form. And whatever is happening in your life, we wanna know how we can specifically pray for you. Let us know by filling out the Connect and Prayer Request form. Beyond this worship service, there are lots of other ways to grow in your faith. Check Revive social media, announcements, and the weekly e-news for what's going on right now. But honestly, just find us on social media. Our mission at Hope is to reach out to the world around us and share the everlasting love of Jesus Christ. As a church, our goal is to give away half of our income to mission partners and local nonprofits. If you wanna give through Revive, we have a really easy text to give option. We've been praying for you and we don't think it's any accident you're here. Welcome to Revive. Good evening, everybody. My name is Levi, and I want to welcome you here. It's so great to have you guys that are joining in person, as well as those who are joining online. Uh, would you guys stand up? We're going to get started with worship, but before we do, I'm going to ask a question for us to share amongst ourselves. If you had to pick your favorite sport, whether it's playing or watching, whatever it is, what would you pick? Don't be afraid to join up with a group or go across an aisle. Discuss amongst yourselves. Sports ball. Give you guys just a little bit to finish up here. All right, let's worship.
Chapter 4, verse 5. But you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling the others the good news and fully carry out the ministry God has given you. A reading from Isaiah 52, verse 7. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of the messenger who brings good news, the good news of peace and salvation the news that God of Israel reigns. A reading from John chapter 20. Again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. Here ends our readings. Let's bow our heads together in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for your presence here in this place. And we thank you from the truth spoken from your word. God, would you open our hearts to experiencing you and hearing what it is that you have to say to us tonight. God, we love you, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Hi, everyone. My name is Lizzie. Welcome to Revive tonight. My name is Kelsey, and we are so glad that you guys are all here worshiping with us tonight. We want to say a welcome to all of you on our live stream and anyone who's new here tonight. If you are here for the first time, you can check out one of these mugs in the back and snag it and take it home. That's a thank you to you for joining us, um, or you can always grab it next week on your way in. And then as you saw in that video with Jamie, you can also scan the QR codes in the seat backs in front of you, and that has some really great information about volunteering, asking for prayer, and connecting <coughs> with us but also follow us on Instagram because we post a lot of good stuff there. Yeah, so we have a couple announcements tonight. First announcement is that we're starting a new sermon series tonight, so hopefully you grabbed one of these booklets on your way in. If not, 
they're still back there and grab a pen because you're going to want to take some notes because this is going to be a really awesome way for us to talk about the goals that we have as a church starting from 2020 all the way to 2030 and just the ways that God is going to be growing in our church and just moving us through our communities and just the world around us. Um, so yeah, we're really excited to talk about that. So if you don't have one of these, go ahead and grab one. Yeah, and then as you may have seen, Hope has moved our plans up to do a mask optional. We changed that last week with the CDC guidelines. So starting tonight, both services are mask optional. If you want to wear your mask, please do. If you don't want to, that's totally fine as well. And then for those of you that want social distancing, distancing still, that's the last three rows in the back are still six feet apart. So there's some social distancing there. We know this is a really kind of weird transition. Like it's really cool to see everyone's faces now, but it's also like, whoa, I can see your face. Um, so thank you for just being loving to each other and being graceful about it and being respectful of everyone around you. Yeah, those are the only answers we have tonight. Thanks for being here and investing in your relationship with God, and we're so excited to see you. Welcome to Revive. The vision reminds us that our best days are yet to come. Go out and share this good news. Build bridges of harmony. We want to be unity agents. Surf new waves of revival sent to the church by the Holy Spirit. We want to be a spirit-filled church. Serve our neighbors in need as the hands and feet of Jesus. We want our cities to be positively changed and to be different 10 years from now than they are today because Lutheran Church of Hope is here. Not just city changers, but world changers because Jesus says go into the whole world. We want to be an intergenerational church. We want to make disciples to go from seeker to believer, to follower, to servant leader, and around again. We want to be kingdom expanders. We want to be legacy makers. We want to love those who are broken, broke, tired, scared, sick, in prison, lost, or wandering, because that's the heart of hope. Well, good evening, and I want to continue to say welcome to all of those of you who are joining us here in person, whether you're joining us online. If that hype video doesn't get you excited, I don't know what will. That, that video was taken from portions of a message that was, uh, was giving, given here uh, about, about two years ago as a part of a, a birthday, our 25th birthday at Hope. And what we did in anticipation of 25 years, a quarter of a, a century of ministry, is, is we started to think about... God, what are, what are the things that you have done through us at Lutheran Church of Hope? Because it was obvious to us, and I was able to be a part of this vision team that was meeting over the course of the summer to get an anticipation for this birthday celebration. And God, it's obvious that, that you've, you've blessed this place. And, and when I say blessed this place, I'm not saying that you've blessed Lutheran Church of Hope, you've blessed Revive, you've blessed it somehow because a lot of people are showing up. Numbers don't quantify what God's will is for us as a church. When somebody asks me about my family, they say, hey, Jeremy, how's your family doing? I've never once responded with four. It's a bad, it's a bad way to describe my family. Hey, how's your family? Oh, oh, we're four. No, but really, how's your family doing? We're four. You, no, I talk about how each person in my family is doing and how they're changing, how they're growing, what's going on in their lives. But as we've seen people's lives transformed, as God's transformed people's lives through this place, we, we started to ask the question, God, you've, 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 you've carried us for 25 years. And it's really important to remember that. It's God who's carried us for 25 years. And as we look at the next 10 years, from the year 2020 uh, through the year 2030, God, what would you do through this place? Not what could we do, but God... What, could, what, what would you do? And so we started and we dreamed and we, we started with our mission. And I'm going uh, to get kind of like a little bit of, 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 of the teacher in me. I started my career out of college. I was a high school English teacher. And so I just want to just share with you kind of, if you have one of these booklets, open up to the first page and you see on the first page, inside of the first page, you'll see that there's a mission there. There's also a vision there. I think sometimes we can look at a mission, we can look at a vision, we say, well, that's cool, but I don't know what it means. It might be just words that are just sound good or, or they're poetic or they're done in a way that people, it's going to be catchy. No, the, the mission and the vision are very intentional for us at Lutheran Church of Hope. If you want to know why we do what we do, we point to our mission, we point to our vision. The mission, very simply put, it tells us what we do, why we exist as a church. 
more than anything else. This is the engine. Our mission is our engine. And our mission at Lutheran Church of Hope, our mission here at Revive, Revive is a part of what God's doing at Lutheran Church of Hope. It's, to me, to my conviction, one of my favorite parts of Lutheran Church of Hope. I love this place. I love people who come to Revive. You guys inspire me. There's so many places you could be right now, but you've chosen to be here. And I think that that matters. And I think it matters because I believe that you're changing the world around you. And that's just such an incredible, cool invitation that God has for us. So what we do as a church is we reach out to the world around us and share the everlasting love of Jesus Christ. That's why we exist. We don't exist to somehow get to a place where we can say that we're kind of like super followers of God. We don't try to exist to become a place where, where people uh, solely just kind of dive more and more and more, deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into their relationship with God. And that's just the sole purpose of it. We're going to get to that this evening. But we exist, God's called us, biblically speaking, and we're going to get to that as well, to, to reach out to the world around us and share the everlasting love of Jesus Christ. That's what we do. The vision is, on, is below that, and you'll see that this vision, that's an aspirational goal, and so the mission is what we do. The vision is who we are. We're a church that, as you read through, is powered by the Spirit. It's important to remember that. It's not what we do. Church, faith, community, a Christian community, people who follow Jesus, it's not about, I, I, I'm going to do all of these things. No. It's God, what, what could you do, what are you going to do through us, powered by the Spirit? There's a, a, an interesting part in Paul's letter to the church in Corinth. It's in 1 Corinthians. And there's a, a bunch of people in the church in Corinth that they had gotten kind of messed up with this. And so there was this guy by the name of Paul. He's the one who writes like two-thirds of the New Testament. Paul was the person that God had sent to, to literally to start that church, to plant that church. Paul planted the church. Then Paul went out because Paul was a missionary. So Paul goes out to start new communities. And so then there's a guy by the name of Apollos that comes. And he becomes like the leader in that early church. And there was a division that was happening in that church because some people were saying, no, I follow Paul. And other people were saying, well, you might follow Paul, but I'm, I'm, a, I'm a true Christian in the Corinthian church. I follow Apollos. And Paul writes to him and says, you guys, you're missing the whole part. You're missing the biggest point. It's like you come to revive and you're like, oh, I, I, I'm in the Levi camp. And other people, I'm in the, I'm in the Jamie camp. And it's like we, we pick our sides. And Paul's saying, you're missing it. So Paul writes to the church in Corinth. He says, I may have planted the seed, I may have been the one that God called to bring the message of the gospel to you in Corinth. And Apollos might be the one who watered it, who, who nurtured it, who walked alongside, who, who was leading it after I left. But Corinthian church, Christian church, revive, remember this. It's God who made it grow. It wasn't Paul. It wasn't Apollos. It was God. It's not Levi, it's not Jamie, it's not Jeremy, it's not Mike, it's not Holden, it's not any. It's God who does this stuff. So we're powered by the Holy Spirit to bring Christ to all cultures. Incredibly important. Very intentional. We don't exist. The church should not exist to only serve people who think like each other, act like each other, look like each other, believe like each other. Called to bring Christ to all culture to Favorite part of this vision statement? To revive. There it is. To revive the world with God's love. To not to look at the world and tell the world how wrong the world is. Nobody wins in that. Think about it. You're coming here to revive for the first time in 15 months without having to wear a face mask. And this whole thing about literally whether we put a cloth covering over our face is something that's literally divided our nation. Can you believe the way that we major on the minors? That that would be the, the, and so it all becomes about what you think, what you believe, what you do, that pins you into a corner. And if you think that way, act like that, believe that way, vote that way, all of those things, then I, ha I, can't, I, can't, I can't have anything to do with you. Man, my goodness, how we've started to miss the mark. We're here to revive the world, not with our opinions, but with God's love. Why? To make heaven more crowded. Not for our benefit. 
but for the benefit and for the, the needs of the world. And so this, we have these 10 goals. And for the next 10 weeks, it's going to be absolutely fascinating. I believe that this is one of those 10-week spans that you're not going to want to miss. You're just not going to want to miss it. To see the, 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 the depth of all of these exciting things. And, and you'll find and you'll discover more increasing, and, and increasing ways in which you can, get, you can get plugged in. God can use you because God's created you. So the first goal, and this one might seem very lofty, when we first started meeting with this, uh, about this as a vision team, when we, the, the, this number was a lot lower, and our vision team, not staff, but our vision team said, you're shooting too low. So our goal, the first goal is evangelism, and we'll get to what that means, but it's to broadcast the life-changing gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, gulp, to 10 million people, through inspired weekly gatherings, to which Revive is a part of, we can worship all of that stuff. Digital outreach. Last service, I talked about Facebook and Instagram, and I realized by just by saying Facebook, I've dated myself. A lot of you are like, you're on Facebook still? Yeah, I am. And I, I'm trying to figure out Instagram. I've gotten it so far, but I don't get the reels thing. I just don't understand. My kids, they're 10 and 9. They tell me about it. I don't know what I'm doing. Anyways, I'll move on. Digital outreach, open house events, garage door events, we call them, big events. Why do we do those things? Here's the way it works in my neighborhood. When I come home and I see a, a, around our neighbors, if their garage doors are up, what are they telling me? Hey, we're home. We're open. Come on over. Think, we're going to do life together. I'm an introvert. When I get home, I get home, I pull my car in, and I quickly hit the garage door, and it goes down. And Bridget, my wife, is like, put the garage door up. I'm like, no, people might come over. But sometimes we do that with the church, right? By the way we act, by the way we do things. Like the, the, the world drives past our home, and they're like, wow, all the lights are off. The garage door is closed. And what we do, and the reason why we do social events here at Revive is to say, hey, we're going to throw the doors open. We want to make it really easy for people to say, to see, hey, there's a place here for you. You're welcome here. You can come on in. We're, we've actually not just think that you might stop by. We're so hoping you'd stop by. We're going to prepare a place for you. Through national and global partnerships, we'll get to that in week four and five, and intentional outreach and, and, and intentional outreach into the world of sports. And we don't do it for our own benefit. We do it because this is what God told us to do. And people desperately need to hear it. And we can't help but to do it. That's the reason why we go and, and, and we share. Because when you have good news, you go and share it. I've said this many times, but there's a reality in my life that people don't tell me good news. I just met with a group of people uh, downstairs. We have this group of people who are uh, Spanish speakers, and we're, we're really pressing into our Latino ministry here at Lutheran Church of Hope. And so we have the Hope t-shirts that we give out, and we have our mission state, statement on the back. And so just the other day, I had this idea like, hey... Let's get the hope shirts, but let's put our mission statement on the back in, in, in Spanish. And so this was going to be a surprise that we we're going to give everybody in the group, and we we're going to get their T-shirt size, and we we're going to kind of make up a story, kind of lie to them, but not really. And then I got down there, and I looked at uh, Isaac, and I said, hey, have you told them? And he's like, yeah, I got the T-shirt sizes. I'm like, okay, guys, we're going to get you shirts. And they're, and they're like, you ruined the surprise. And I'm like, yeah, but it's good news. I'm so excited about it. I can't help but share it. It's the way it is with the gospel. But Jesus also says in Matthew chapter 28, it's what he says right before he ascends into heaven. He says this incredibly powerful word. And it's a very much, it's a transition word. I was uh, an English teacher and I use this all the time with my students. Said anytime you read the word therefore, you have to ask yourself a very elemental question. What's the therefore therefore? Because it's there for a reason. And the word therefore, what it literally does is it points the reader back. It points the listener back. Therefore means there's something that took place. And when that thing took place, the people who uh, experienced that or the people who heard it or the people who read it, all of a sudden something was going to change and it was going to alter their behavior going forward. So Jesus had just appeared to over 500 people 11 different times after he had been put to death, and Jesus says to his disciples who had met him on the mountaintop just before he ascends into heaven, he says, I've been given all authority on heaven and on earth. 
You realize, now you understand, you've been witnesses. You can, with your own eyes, be able to see the fact that what God said he was going to do, he actually did. And that good news changed your life, and it's going to change everybody else's life, lives. So therefore, go. The word go, go in the New Testament is used over 230 t- times. Matthew's gospel alone, it's used 54 times. Sometimes we think about faith, we think about church, we think about following Jesus, we think about our relationship with God, and we think it's something that we should keep incredibly private. Or it's individual. Or it's kind of like, it's more of a static thing in our life. What we see is it's incredibly dynamic. And it's the way that we are created. There's a part of our lives that we have an input and we have an output. That's the course of life. You, 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 you receive, and that's really important, but you receive and you also give. I had the opportunity about five or six years ago to go over to the Holy Lands. I was able to take a trip, spent two weeks over there, and we were able to go and we spent two weeks kind of seeing all the sites, a lot of the sites, not all the sites, a lot of the sites that literally that you read about in Scripture. It was wild. It was amazing. And one of the highlights of the trip is we were able to go and we were able to go and, and, and go into the, the, the Jordan River, the place where Jesus was actually baptized. Mind-blowing. Like, my goodness, this could have been the very exact spot that he was standing when, when he was baptized. I mean, it just... Just enough to blow your mind. And then the Jordan River, it feeds two bodies of water that are entirely different. The Sea of Galilee, which is just so full and so rich with life. And the Dead Sea, which can sustain no life. Fed by the same source of water, one has an output, the other doesn't. You think about in in, in life, there's an activity, there's a, a life in, in our movement, and in, in when we take and give, take and give, and this is the way of faith. But if you're anything like me, you start to think about it, and you're like, well, that's kind of intimidating. Like, I don't know how to do it. Or I would start to, I, I, would, I would be a part of this broadcast goal to, to, to share the gospel with the people around me to do the work of, of an evangelist, of evangelism, which literally means good news spreader. That's what that word means. I would do that, but I'm not qualified. I don't know enough. I, I'm not, I, don't, I don't have the, 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 the knowledge base maybe that some other people have. We're making it way too complicated. It's really simple when you break it down. The first step of being able to, to do the work of evangelism, to broadcast the message of Jesus Christ, the very first thing that you do is you just, sh- you just, you just show up in people's lives. Chances are, I would guess, that every single one of us has gone through a time in our life that was incredibly difficult. Something happened, and we didn't know how we were going to get through that time. And a lot of us have had in those times somebody that has come and, and entered into our life, and they've walked alongside of us during that time. And I would venture to guess that you probably don't remember a lot of what they said, but you'll never forget that they were there. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, very well-known statement that he has. He says, you're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. The light part is really self-explanatory, isn't it? I mean, why, why, does, a, why, does, why is a light needed? A, a light shines into the darkness, and then the darkness flees. But they're like, well, what's the whole thing about salt? And I think oftentimes our brain goes to salt means just its, its spice, its variety, its flavor. Think about the culture in which Jesus lived. Jesus didn't go to the, the grocery store, get a gallon of milk, and put it in the refrigerator. If, if there was meat that they had that was perishable in a very hot climate, if they didn't eat it right away, they had to do something to preserve it. And so they would take salt, and they would pack that which was perishable to preserve it. This is what it means to show up into people's lives. Jesus says, you're the light of the earth. You're the light of the world. Yeah, you shine light in dark places, but you do that because you have a a presence that will literally embody the message of Jesus Christ and you'll preserve 
those who are perishable. You show up, and you also share it. Share your story. You have a unique story that's who you are. You have unique experiences that have shaped and they have formed who you are. And good, bad, and everything in between, none of those things are are beyond the use of of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8.28, it says, God will work together in all things for good. When I was a fifth grader, when I was uh, like 10 years old, 11 years old, I was diagnosed as type 1 diabetic. And so I've been diabetic for, you know, so, so many years of my life. And I, I have this doctor. She's wonderful. She is the smartest person I have ever met. She studies the disease. She knows the disease. She knows all about it. And I have this joke with my doctor. I always tell her, like, hey, I love, you know, you have forgotten more about diabetes than I'll ever know. Like, it's, it's, it's crazy how much you know. But given the choice to talk to you about being diabetic or talk to somebody else who's diabetic about being diabetic, I'll choose them every single time, even if they've only been diabetic for a week. Why? Because we speak the same language. We know something that the other knows that nobody else who hasn't had that experience could ever even dream of what that would be like. I think about the way in which that works in our lives. We, we, we show up and we walk alongside of people and we start to share our story. When we show up and people say, well, why? I, don't, I just don't understand why you, would, why you would give so much of your time, you'd give so much of your energy, that you would, you would sacrifice your own like maybe desires of what you could be doing and spend your time with me. Why are you doing this? And then you start to say, well, hey, I went through this and somebody did this. I was in a place where I felt lost and then I realized because somebody loved me that there was a God who loved them that loved me and then all of a sudden I realized that even though I felt lost, I was actually found. I was in a situation that I couldn't see the way out of it but somebody shared their story with me and I realized that now I was given sight that I didn't have on my own. Paul writes it this way in his letter to the church in Corinth. He says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it in response to the glory of God. Love, he, Paul says it this way in Romans chapter 12. He says, don't just pretend to love other people. Actually love them. Share your life with them. Share your experiences with them. When somebody says, why would you do that? You say, hey, there's something that I've experienced that's, even though I don't totally understand it, has, has shaped, it's transformed, it's changed my life. And we shout it. I had to think of another word that started with the S-H sound, so I said shout it. But it really, it's just sharing the, the reality of the gospel. It's not just sharing our story, but more importantly, it's, it's, it's sharing and, and it's pointing to God's story. Caitlin the, was the middle reader in the scripture reading. She read from the prophet Isaiah. And the prophet, prophet Isaiah says, How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of the messengers who bring the good news. Isaiah is talking about the ones who would carry this good news to, to tell the people that, that victory, that, that life was going to be given to them. How beautiful are the feet of the, on the mountain of the people who are coming up to give the good news. Paul picks up on this and quotes this in Romans chapter 10. He says, so faith comes from hearing, that is hearing the good news about Jesus Christ. The word goes out, the word of God goes out, the Bible says, and it never comes back empty. Faith comes from, literally, faith is a gift that's given to us, and it's given to us as we hear the truth about who God is and what God's done. And then Paul goes on and says, but how are people going to hear about it if nobody tells them? And how are people going to tell them if nobody sends them? How beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring the good news, who share the message, who share the message of Jesus Christ. It's literally, it's just pointing people to to the story of a God who loved the world so much that he gave, his, he gave his one and only son. It's always just incredibly exciting to me to think about what brought people here. I, I wonder if anybody asked you, like, why, why are you here tonight? You might say, I don't, I don't know. Like, somebody told me to come, and so I'm here. I don't even know if I want to be here. Like, I'm kind of bored right now. I wish it would get over. It'll be done in just a second, I promise. 
But every one of us is here standing on the shoulders of somebody who came before us. It's important to remember that. I wonder who's going to stand on your shoulders. Who's going to hear about this God who loves them because of you? You're not an accident. You never have been. And God's doing extraordinary things. And so as you think about that, you start to pray about it. God, who's in my life that needs to hear your good words? And God, give me the wisdom and the courage and the strength to do what you created me to do. It's in the beginning of the book of Acts. Jesus had just uh, given them this message, the disciples the message, to go into the ends of the earth, powered by the Holy Spirit, to bring the the good news of Jesus Christ to all cultures, to to make heaven more crowded. And so the the first disciples, they're doing this, and all of a sudden, things just started getting a little bit more difficult than they thought it was going to be. And they didn't know what to do, so they started to pray about it, and they they, they prayed for courage. Not that God would kind of give them, take the call away from them. Like, hey, God, just, we, don't, we don't want to do this anymore. They just said, God, give us the courage. They began to pray with one another and pray that God would allow them to be the people that God created them to be. There is something that I have never been able to experience, and I can't wait until I'm able to experience it. The thing I've never experienced, I've never, ever been able to, to have a new car. Maybe some of you have purchased a new car. Like, it's like literally like the only people that have driven it are the people that work at the dealership. Like, I roll in a 2008 Toyota Camry, has 185,000 miles, and it's just getting warmed up right now. Like, someday, maybe when I'm 75, I'll be able to afford a new car. It's not now. And so I just, I just can't, like, I, I'm not a big car person, but when people get a new car, I'm like, oh, my goodness, can I, like, can I smell it? It smells so good. But the thing that just absolutely drives me crazy is what, oftentimes when people get a new car, they get it, and then they never drive it. It's like, hey, we're, gonna go, we're all going to go out tonight. Who's going to drive? And they're like, hey, you should drive. You just got, no, I'm not going to drive my car. Something might happen to it. And it's like, well, why did you buy the thing? Or you park like a million miles away from where everybody else is parked because you're so scared that something might happen to the vehicle that you purchased to bring you to places where things happen. It doesn't make sense to me. Like, isn't the reason you bought the car to use the car? But sometimes we just use it and we, we look at the car. And I think we look at the, our faith the same way sometimes. Like, Oh, like, let's just look at it or let's just study it. Like, my whole job as somebody who follows Jesus is just, it's just, it's only, it's simply, it's purely just to know more and more and more and more and more. And people are like, well, how does this change your life? You're like, well, no, I'm just going to keep studying it and I'm going to keep studying it and I'm going to keep studying it. And you're like, well, don't you understand? Like, this is actually telling you a story that was only written down so that you could share it. Like this is a living, a living, active thing that's going on here. And we don't just put it in the garage, put the garage door down and say, make sure nothing happens to it. Think about it this way. People who are smart enough to, to, to create a rocket ship. They go, they study it, and they realize like, wow, we can actually build something that can be on the earth and literally can get to outer space. My brain doesn't have a compartment on how that could actually work. I don't understand it. I don't pretend to ever be able to understand it. But they are able to do that. But what happens if they built the first spacecraft and they said, well, you know, here's what the engine's like. Here's the fuel it uses. Here's the aerodynamics that we use. And people are like, well, are you going to shoot it? And like, no, let me just, let me just, let me just look at it because isn't it really beautiful? Or are you going to want to get in the rocket and fly it? I mean, you think about it. Elon Musk, I don't want to start a huge debate on this. What does he want to do? He wants to let people experience going to the moon. But what happens if he just says, hey, just, just look at the rocket? You'd say, no, get in the rocket and think about the view that you get from up there, that you never get from down here. Think about the way in which that thing flies and how it changes the perspective of everybody who's a witness to that. And so maybe take a look at this and just be able to feel it and be able to see it and be able to think about not a rocket, but about what God's doing in you with your faith to the world around you. Take a look. Fuel pump. This is it. Fuel bump 
so we're hauling the mail. We are go for launch. T minus 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7. John chapter 3, Jesus says to somebody who's desperately in need of knowing to the truth of what the kingdom of God is all about. The guy says, Jesus, what must a person do to, to experience real life? Certainty of being assured of the promise that God has. Because this person says, I've been searching for it in so many different things and I haven't been able to find it. Jesus says in John chapter 3, he says, there is, a, there is a whole new life for you. And this life that God has for you, it's a gift that God wants to give to you. Open your heart to it. Receive it. And Jesus tells him about it, and the guy keeps asking questions and said, just doesn't understand it. So Jesus breaks it down and gets really, really pointed about it. He says, look, Nicodemus, this is the truth of God. God loved the world so much that he sent his one and only son into the world that anybody who believes in him, not just the ones that get it right, because none of us do. Let's be honest. Faith is something that gives us permission to be honest. None of us get it right all of the time. For God so loves the world, loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him would not perish, but they would have eternal life. I think there's a part of our culture that kind of has this misunderstanding or maybe they have been told that there's this reality that God would rather to have more people in hell than heaven. That hell is something that's really easy to fall into and heaven is something extraordinarily difficult to ever make it to. Look to John chapter 3, because I believe the reverse to be true, because I believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. And look, we can sit on our hands, and we don't need to share this story with anybody else. God's not going to love us less if we don't go out and we take the church and send it into orbit and start to tell people that there is a God who loves them. But why wouldn't we? My goodness, he wants to make heaven crowded. We have 70 or so years here on planet Earth. But we have eternity. Eternity means really big with no edges, literally speaking. We have an eternity to share with people, to broadcast the message, to do the work of evangelism. It's a good goal. It's our first goal. And revive it's worthy of everything we have. So as we close tonight, we're going to uh, sing a song about just this truth of the gospel. So I invite you to stand, whether you're here in person or online. And I'm going to pray, and then after I pray, we're going to sing, and then uh, we'll go home or go back to whatever it is you were doing before you tuned in online. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you for giving us a message to share. But more than giving you thanks for a message that we have to share. We give you thanks 
for giving us your son, Jesus Christ. Because you saved us, God, when we were lost and when we were blind. But your amazing grace, God, allowed us to know that we're found so that we can see again. So God, move in us so that we can bring that to a world that desperately needs to hear it because you love them. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
Thank you so much for joining us here this evening. It's been an absolute blast to be able to be with you, but, but keep going, Revive. Keep doing what you do. There's a lot of work that we get to do and get to be a part of, and don't ever under underestimate what God could do through you. So have a wonderful week. Just an invitation. Bring someone with you next week. We'll be here, same time, same place, and we'd love to see you and to see those you want to bring with you as we celebrate and we worship with one another. Have a wonderful week. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.